Good morning. My name is Paul Carr. Um, I am a blogger, a podcaster, an engineer, and I am also a deputy director of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. And I'll talk more about who we are and why I'm at the skeptical thinking track and not at the new age track or, or uh, some other kind of uh, um, less, critically, less critical thinking oriented uh, conversation. Um, I, I consider myself a skeptic. Uh, in fact, I am a pretty stern skeptic in most cases. So why am I investigating UFOs? Why do I even bother investigating UFOs? Uh, I'll talk about a number of things. First of all, th this presentation will there will be a, there's a link to it. You can you can download it, um, and it is available under Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike, which means you can distribute it if you wish, uh, give, given the attribution share alike constraint, which is not very severe. Basically, you can make as many copies as you want. And the, uh, all the linkage that you'll need will be at wowsignalpodcast.com, which is the blog for my podcast. So what I'm going to talk about today is not so much why, I'm not going to tell you so much about why I am a UFO investigator. I'm going to talk more, I'm going to try to show you why I'm a UFO investigator and a skeptic and how that works together and why that's something a little bit different than what we've seen before. What I want to talk about is a particular case that, we, that I have participated in the investigation of, what we did last year, um, as well as in more, more in general, what the skeptical approach to, to fields like UFO investigation should be, can be, and what we hope to get out of it. I also want to talk about um, some of the claims that are around the UFO field, some of the, the very interesting questions that impinge upon that field, and and, and what, how that relates to UFOs and really does it relate to UFOs. And those, questions, those are the questions that I think everybody at a science fiction convention is interested in. Is there alien life? Is there intelligent alien life in outer space? Have they ever visited Earth? Will they ever visit Earth? Will, will we ever visit them? Those kinds of questions are, I think everybody here probably finds that to be a fairly interesting question. Everybody who's ever watched Star Trek when they were a kid, like I did, said, that is so cool. I want to go out there in outer space and see all those aliens. Well, I still do actually. But, and in fact, I'm a spacecraft systems engineer. I, that's what I do for a living is, is build spacecraft. I don't go to the stars, but uh, you can see how I've essentially dedicated my life to that. The, so that, those questions we'll talk about to some extent as well. Now, first I want to talk about, though, skepticism, because this is the skeptical thinking track. And I was invited here to, as a skeptic, and I am a skeptic. What is a skeptic? Is a skeptic someone, some sourpuss who shows up and ruins the party, says, you guys are all wrong. Is it a defender of orthodoxy? Is, is, is a skeptic a, a person whose primary job is to deflate and debunk? Uh, well, if you look at the more publicly um, visible skeptics, somebody like James Randi, that's what they seem to be doing all the time, is they, they're debunking. And the main reason for that is there's an awful lot of bunk out there. <laughs> and I have no problem with debunking, and I, and I admire people like James Randi who go after some really, really dubious people making some really, really dubious claims. Um, but to me, skepticism is a lot more than debunking. In fact, Debunking, it to me, is probably the least interesting thing about it. De skepticism is actually, a skeptic to me is someone who embraces <coughs> doubt. Not just doubt about weird stuff. Not just doubt about the claims that someone, you know, can, made by a faith healer or somebody selling water as if it were medicine. 
Those are the kinds of claims that James Randi takes on. Um, I'm frankly not that interested in those claims. Uh, they all smell bad to me and I just stay away from them. But what I'm interested in is skepticism is, is doubt as a part of the belief system. I think we all have a belief system. We're human. We pretty much can't function without a belief system. But if we include in that belief system doubt, if we embrace doubt, if we say we love uncertainty, we like not knowing everything, we like not having final answers, we like getting to better and better questions rather than to better and better answers, then I think that you have the beginnings of a, of a skeptical person. So the this, this skeptic therefore has to embrace truth over comfort, often stepping outside the comfort zone and saying, you know, this doesn't really comport with my way of thinking, but maybe it's true because there's evidence for it. A sense of beauty. Now, why do I say a sense of beauty? Because we can't think about everything. We can't focus on everything. We have to have this intuitive sense of what seems to fit, what seems to be coherent, what makes sense in all the noise, in all the randomness in life. We have to be able to find that pattern, those beautiful patterns that we see in nature. And you have to like that. Curiosity, very important in a skeptic. A, a, an uncurious skeptic, in my, my view, is not a skeptic. Um, that's, some, that's just a, a dogmatist. Uh, you may say, I'm skeptical about X because it doesn't fit into my ideology. That's not a skeptic. Critical thinking, very important, necessary, not sufficient. That isn't just thinking logically. It's thinking in terms of evidence. It's thinking about claims in a, in a way that it takes into account the fact that we know there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of biases, there's a lot of uncertainty in life. And understanding human shortfalls, including your own. Is a skeptic a person who has no biases, no delusions, no false narratives, no false memories? No, a skeptic is, is, a, is a human. We all have memories that are incorrect. We all have biases. We all look for confirmation of our, of our belief system every time we look at the world. Skeptics do too. Skeptics are not perfect. The difference is that a skeptic understands that he, he's got that going on in his, his own mind. He's skeptical of himself first. And I, I've been encountering this lately myself in doing UFO investigations. I often go for the the explanation that, that makes me most comfortable and is easy for me because, you know, if, it's a, if, it's, if I think it's an astronomical explanation, well, that's something I'm comfortable with. But I've recently, working a case right, actually, I'm working a case right now where I think the answer is going to be something I'm not so comfortable with and I'm going to have to get away from my biases and, and look for something. And there may not even be an answer, but, uh, and I can talk about the case if there's time since the witness has come forward publicly. Um, the scientific process. I won't bore you with a lecture on the scientific process, but you have to not just, not just understand it. You have to be willing to understand that the only way to deal with your own cognitive shortfalls is to go through this process. And that has to do with collaboration. You have to work with other people. There's a social skill and gosh, I hate social skills, but <laughs> you need it. You need social skills to be a good skeptic. You need to be able to work with other people and you have to be open to their ideas because your own ideas are, are certainly biased. And so are theirs. But together you can work, collaborate, and, and advance knowledge. So I could, have, I could have just described a scientist, not a skeptic. Those two things are almost the same. A skeptic is basically anyone, every, every good scientist is a skeptic. Not all skeptics are scientists. But to me, this is the, these are the kinds of values actually I'm trying to instill in my children. Don't have to know everything. It's OK to admit that you're wrong. It's OK to admit that you don't know. Now, how does that do? 
In, in the past, skeptics have approached UFO investigation in a way that I think has damaged skepticism. Uh, and we'll talk about that, but skepticism is, as I think, I think it's, it's essential to advancing knowledge. It's essential to removing false knowledge. And there's, there's more. There's more that's wrong than that's right. Getting to the truth is very, very difficult in any field. Getting to falsehood is very, very easy, and there's an awful lot of falsehood out here. As I've said, the, the skeptics, the, the more publicly visible skeptics, are mainly engaged in debunking falsehood. And in the UFO investigation, we get a lot of falsehoods. We get a lot of misinterpretations. We get a lot of hoaxes. And we have to, and we have to when we f do the investigation, find that it's bunk, then we become debunkers. But that's not our normal function. Having, the problem is that you don't have to have a final answer. You don't have to take a UFO case and say, this is definitively that. It's all right for a skeptic to say, it's unknown what that is. That leads me to the next principle. No one is entitled to jump to conclusions. Not the skeptic, not the believer, not the witness, not the investigator, no one. Because we say something is unknown does not mean it's a spaceship from Zeta Reticuli. It's just an unknown. Because we say something there's, there's uncertainty in the data. It does not allow us to interpret the data in a way that fits with our biases. We don't get to jump to conclusions. We have to be willing to say, this is all we know about this case. This is all we understand. So we begin every investigation with certain values. Curiosity, uncertainty. We don't go in saying, this is crazy woo, we're going to debunk it. We just say, we don't know what it is. If, if we knew what it was, we wouldn't even be investigating. Respect for the people involved, the witnesses and other people involved in the case. We always treat them with as much respect as we can. When we find, if we find that they're rascals <laughs> and are trying to hoax us, their respect will decline considerably, but we'd start with that. Patience. A lot of times, you can't just go in, identify what they saw, and get out. A lot of times, it may take years to complete the investigation. And we are currently engaged in an investigation I'm going to show you for at least over a year now. And I think we're going to continue this investigation for a long time. I don't know when we're going to close it. I'm not sure even if we can close it. And finally, a willingness to admit that you're stumped. All skeptics have to be able to admit that. Some don't like to because they, they say mainstream science has the answers and I'll pick an answer off the shelf and feed it to you. No, that, that, we don't do that. Now, there, how many people know who this person is? The character, not, not the actress. <laughs> Emily Latella, right? And what, what would Emily do? Emily would get all excited about something she'd misinterpreted and demand editorial response, right? And then the announcer would explain to her, oh, but that's not really what's going on. She would say, never mind. Well, Emily, there are not very many Emilys out there who are, quite, who are willing to say never mind. Right? <laughs> Emily uh, would say that. Quite often when we, people get very excited about something they misinterpreted, very excited. You would not believe how life-changing it can be for them to see Venus on the horizon and dancing around and changing colors. And when you tell them, oh, well, here's definitive proof that what you saw was the planet Venus, they're still excited about what they saw. The, so here's the UFO litany from the skeptical point of view. And it's boring. It doesn't interest me very much. I wouldn't be doing this if, this was, if I thought this is all there is. UFOs are misperceptions of common phenomena. Certainly, that is, there's a lot of them that are like that. Right? 
Uh, I just mentioned Venus. There's a whole lot of others. That we've, in doing investigations, I haven't come across these. They're real. They're not just something the newspaper made up. Hoaxes. Yes, hoaxes, I, in my, my experience, are not common, but they do occur. And when they do occur, if they're clever enough, they can get, bring a lot of people along with them. Delusions. I've seen that. Uh, there are people who simply um, are deluded about what they've experienced. Uh, I think probably everyone has some delusions. Um, we probably wouldn't have children if we didn't have delusions. <laughs> but uh, the, there are some people who, who can be very deluded about a UFO experience or what they thought was a UFO experience. I recently heard a psychologist say that a uh, that people who are deluded about one thing can be perfectly functional on everything else and, and perfectly able to deal with uncertainty, but they're deluded about this one thing. And confirmation bias, that is people want to believe, believe, you know, believing is seeing. If you believe that there are flying saucers zipping around over your head, you'll see them. And finally, false memories, which is a more common phenomenon than I think we Probably most of us have some false memories about our childhoods, about our teenage years. We remember things, and it's usually in the details where the false, falsehood is. But some people remember entire events that never happened. And this has been scientifically shown. You can actually induce false memories. So, and then there's the cesspit of ufology, right? All the, all the craziness, all the profiteering, all the nonsense, all the infighting, uh, oh, it's just, it goes on and on. And, and if you go to, to most UFO conventions, well, you don't even have to go to UFO convention. Just go into YouTube and type UFO. <laughs> You'll see what I'm talking about. There's a lot of just nonsense, silliness. People screaming, proof, this video of a light in the sky is proof that we are not alone. Well, you know, I don't think we're alone either, but I don't think that's proof. And I haven't got proof. I haven't even got compelling evidence yet. We're working on that, but not there. Um, and there's the notion that UFO believers are delusional, quasi-religious, anti-science. And there's definitely a lot of that. There's no question. And you get out amongst the believers, you'll see that. So... And, and there are good skeptical questions about UFOs, right? Why do we see so, why, there, there are really very few good cases. There's very little physical evidence. <coughs> if, and some people will say there's no physical evidence. Depends on who you ask. Um, there are so very, you know, recently we had the, uh, the Russian meteor that came down and blew up over a Russian town and injured a lot of people and shattered a lot of windows. There were a lot of videos of that. They all have dash cams. They have these, in Russia, they have these, these uh, cameras on their car because apparently there's a lot of accidents and the legal system is a little strange there. So they have these dash cams and we saw lots and lots of videos of this meteor coming in at high altitude, very, very bright and just blowing up and, and it was spectacular. Well, why don't we have those of UFOs if there's so many of them? Well, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question exactly, but there should be more, you would think. Uh, and there are so very few sightings by amateur astronomers. I mean, the people who are outside looking at the sky and know what's in the sky, know how to identify what they see, don't see as many UFOs as people who just step out for the first time in their life and look up. Right? So there's, there's definitely... We can say that the vast majority of UFO cases are just people making mistakes. I think that's, that's true. Um, and also, something that we've, I'll talk about a bit more, there's been no clear attempt by any alien life form to contact humanity. Some people will say, yes, oh yes, there has been. I, they were in my bedroom last night, but the truth is, no, there's nothing we can all agree on there's been no day the earth stood still scenario where a flying saucer lands on the, on the Washington Mall and the army comes up to them and, 
and a robot, robot comes out and blasts the army. <laughs> I love that movie, but <laughs> it's, it's really a human narrative. It has nothing to do with aliens. Uh, and, but that kind of thing has not happened, and no variation of it has happened. Nobody has landed in the UN and said, um, we're here to serve man. Uh, and I don't think they would, if, if they, even if they understood humanity, which they might not. I doubt they didn't go to the UN to try to, to uh, contact us. But, so there's good skeptical questions about UFOs, and there's a lot of mess. There's a lot of nastiness, toxic <coughs> mess out there that no scientist will touch with a 10-foot pole. They, it's not the scientists are bad guys who want to debunk alien life. I've talked to a lot of scientists who would love to find evidence of alien life, intelligent alien life or even just microbes. They would love that. But they won't get into the UFO field at all. And the main reason they won't is because of that toxicity, that laughter curtain, that fog of, of silliness that surrounds the topic. And I don't blame them one bit. It's not just that it would be a career limiting move, it would be an emotionally taxing way to spend your career when in fact there are promising avenues to explore. And if you talk to Seth Shostak, who's a famous SETI researcher, he's looking for ET, but he doesn't believe in UFOs. He doesn't think UFOs are, are from outer space. And so he doesn't spend any of his time in that. He'd much rather listen to a radio telescope trying to find signals. He thinks that's a more promising approach. Um, I respect that. So I'm not really a professional scientist. I'm, I work with them all the time, but I, that's not what I do. So I don't have a scientific reputation to protect. And I'm also pretty thick-skinned. I can handle the silliness. I can handle the, uh, the true believers. So I still want to investigate. And I'm going to show, try to show you why I want to investigate. Uh, this is a picture of myself and Antonio Paris out in New Mexico investigating a, an alleged UFO crash site. Um, we had a detailed location for it. Uh, Antonio's got quite a, a, a detailed presentation on this. It's not a UFO crash site. It was an airplane crash site. Um, and somehow that got conflated with all the Roswell noise and to... Um, How far is this from Roswell? It's quite far. Uh, it's, on, it's in western New Mexico. Um, not very far from the Arizona border. Okay, so it's pretty, it's about good ways across the state. Yeah, oh yes, yes. Well, I won't get into the mythology of what happened in 1947. Uh, I'm much more interested in what's happening now. But, uh, yeah, the, and we, we met there with people who are true believers, who, believe, who believed in their hearts and souls that a UFO had crashed there. We looked, we looked objectively for evidence. We didn't find any. What's more, we did find very strong evidence that, it, that an aircraft had crashed at that site. Uh, about the same time, in 1944 or 1947, but given the, ver the weakness of the evidence for a UFO crash there, that it, it, and the fact that we found debris from the aircraft right at that site, I think we've definitively shown that it, that was an aircraft crash. This is the kind of investigation we do. Uh, and. Uh, this is one of my inspirations for wanting, I, I won't, like I said, I'm not going to tell you so much, but um, these guys started a podcast a couple of years ago, uh, Ross and Carrie. And I recommend their podcast. It's a lot of fun. Um, they are very brave young people. They have done some extraordinary things as skeptical investigators. They get out there amongst the true believers, like, I don't know anyone else that does this, what they do. They've gone. They actually got baptized into the Mormon church. They, um, they joined the Raelians. They have uh, taken homeopathic overdoses. They've done, which, and they've done painful things. They've had acupuncture. They've done all kinds of stuff. And I thought, well, you know, they're getting out. There. They're not just sitting in their armchair saying that's a bunch of crap. They're getting out there and they're very congenial they're very friendly. They go out to these folks and they, they're not the sourpusses. 
they're nice people. They go out and actually sometimes, sometimes they even make friends with them. Yes. So you're saying they're like the Mythbusters of police? Well, they don't exactly do what Mythbusters, well, they kind of are. I mean, they, they do experiments, but the experiments are that they go out to uh, various groups and participate in those groups. And then they come back and they give the best assessment they can uh, on their podcast. And I recommend, oh no, Ross and Kerry. And I, got, I found this inspiring. I said, you know, I should be out there too. I, should, I don't want to do what they're doing because uh, it's too painful. <laughs> but I, I'm willing to do some of it. And I, do, I have a lifelong interest in outer space, in spacecraft, in UFOs, uh, less. But, you know, I finally said, you know, I've always wanted to go check out when these people say they see something weird in the sky. I want to check it out. I want to find out what they saw. And I've heard lots of ex explanatory stuff that's just armchair, just sitting back and going, yeah, well, that doesn't look like UFO to me. Well, I want to go out there and actually do the digging, do the spade work, find out. And I was out in New Mexico about three weeks ago doing the digging, literally looking for pieces of UFO. Didn't find it. I wasn't too surprised. But so we don't just dismiss or poo-poo UFO claims. We go out and look, investigate. And we'll find, whatever we find, we find. Whatever, wherever the evidence takes us. But here's what I will tell you. I said, if you don't want, want to go do the hard work, finding out what's going on there, best just to say nothing. Now, James Randi goes out and does the hard work. Uh, he goes to the faith healer meeting and uh, exposes what, what they're up to, right? I want to do the hard work too. I want to get out there and, sh and, and show the world Here's what the evidence is, here's what it isn't, and here's what we can reasonably conclude from it. This is Antonio Paris. He started aerial phenomenon investigations a couple years ago. Um, I joined in November uh, of 2011. Uh, Antonio has, is, is a serious investigator. He's, he's a trained investigator with DOD and FBI. He's a former military officer. Uh, he has the knowledge of how to investigate. He has leadership skills and he has energy. He has unbelievable energy. So I, I was interested in investigating UFOs, but I did not want to start an organization because I just, I have a very busy life already. Antonio um, had the time and the energy and the organization and leadership skills to make it happen. And, and this guy is, in my view, a skeptic. Now, some people say he's not a skeptic because he doesn't toe the skeptical line on everything. But skepticism isn't about checking boxes. It isn't about defending dogma. It's about looking hard at the evidence critically. And he's done that. And I think he's, he's proven he's a skeptic. Not, he's shown he's a skeptic. Um, and you can go to aerial-phenomenon.org to learn more about him and, um, and our investigations. And we've done quite a lot of investigations together. He's even written a book, uh, not a bad little book. Uh, it, it, it goes over the two, basically the 2011 and 2012 cases, including the case I'm going to show you in just a minute. We used to take every case that was reported to us and investigate it. That was more for training. We are now taking many fewer cases for, we'll take, we'll take any report in our, to our database, but we are, we're only investigating certain cases that have, that are recent, have multiple credible witnesses. Physical evidence or video photos, physical evidence is, is the big push now. Uh, lights in the sky generally don't, we don't investigate that much because they almost always turn out to be something that is easily explained. And it's really more, you give that to the guy who's training and is investigating, as an investigator, here, run the astronomy, run the weather, run the, uh, look where the airports are, figure out what this person saw. And it's nearly always that. So we just don't get much out of lights in the sky. And even if we could say, well, the light in the sky is unexplained, what have we got? Light in the sky, right? Yes. It's not much evidence of anything. Unidentified flying object. 
and we prefer daytime sightings over night because you know the signal noise is much much better at daytime. We don't have pet answers. We often come to the conclusion we just don't know. And this this is a, I'm going to show you brief this brief video. This video was part of a case we investigated it involved a UFO a, a black triangle UFO flying over a hotel was witnessed by two witnesses, um, one of whom has come forward. And this was followed up by a men in black visit. Now this is part of the UFO mythology. It has very dubious origins, this whole men in black thing. Uh, it was largely a, a fictional creation um, by people who were selling pulp magazines in the 50s. However, is there a core mystery to the men in black? We don't know. But we do have video, uh, security cam video, from the point where they, 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 it is said that two men in black came to visit the hotel and were asking questions about this witness. What do we make of this? Well, there's no question that two men in black arrived at the hotel. These guys right here. Those two guys right there. Uh -huh. You can't really see their faces. Um, they are dressed just like the classic men in black with the fedoras and the... Um, they, they'd be Orthodox Jews if, if, if it wasn't, they don't have beards, but we don't know what to make of this, right? Well, the people at the hotel said that they did come around and were asking questions about the UFO sighting. What's the possible explanation? Well, it could be a hoax, it could be somebody pranking them, it could be a lot of things, right? But it, we all found it a little weird. And I don't even know that the, if that, that isn't just a prank, okay? But we did find it rather odd and interesting, and, and it's just an example of sometimes you get to a situation where the easy answer is to say it's a prank, but really the truth is we don't have an answer. We just don't know what to make of that. Uh, it was associated with the UFO sighting. We have witnesses that said that. There's some very upset people in the hotel. Uh, other people in the hotel thought it was a prank. So, you know, I don't have an answer for you. But don't misuse Occam's razor, that's my point. Don't say, well, just because this doesn't comport with my sense of the world and how the world is constructed, that's a simpler explanation. Not necessarily. So anyway, I want to get off that and on to what are we trying to do with UFO con, I mean, with, with UFO investigations and aerial phenomena. We want to get toward higher strangeness cases. This is a probability strangeness matrix. On, on, on the x-axis here, probability, increasing probability, and on the y-axis, increasing strangeness. Most UFO cases are in this area here. High probability, low strangeness, lights in the sky. Low probability, high strangeness, hoaxes, delusions. Um, the rare good cases are high probability, high strangeness. That is, highly credible evidence and high strangeness. Something that just doesn't fit to any normal model of how the, you know, what's, what's flying around in our skies or what's landing on our front lawns. Uh, does science know everything that's in the sky? Some scientists will tell you, no, we don't. We just don't. We can't say that we can make that claim. We know a lot of things that are in the sky, and most UFOs are one of those things. But, um, and that's down here at these low, these low strangeness cases. And so what we're trying to do is move away from, we get most of our cases are the high probability low strangeness. There's, they're telling the truth as best as they understand it. It's just that what they saw wasn't that weird and move towards the rare good cases. And now we get to the, to the fun part, the actual ca case that we have. Now, I'm not going to go over the whole case, because it's a very complex case that goes back to this person's childhood. So, and he has come forward. Um, his name is Richard. And he has, he has gotten a, um, he, has, he has what we call a high strangeness case. Um, I'm not going to reach any conclusions today about what he's experienced. What I am going to, because I don't know what he's experienced. It, it, could, it could be lucid dreams. It could be a lot of things. It's not, it's not evidence for alien visitation. 
at least not until we come up with something more solid than his memories. But what we do have is a small bit, a bit of physical evidence. And every time we get physical evidence, we jump on it, even if it's a little bit. And this is a little bit. This is not a lot of physical evidence. This is a tiny, tiny thread of physical evidence. We're hoping to follow that thread a little further. The witness in, uh, in July 2011, the witness woke up in the morning and found a small foreign object stuck in his arm, about a centimeter long, maybe even a little shorter, um, just stuck in his arm. It wasn't buried or embedded in his arm. It was just there. He pulled it right out. Um, as probably any of us would do if we found a sliver in our arm, he just pulled it out. And um, it wasn't very deeply in there, into his skin. He placed the object in a small polyethylene bag, Ziploc bag. Um, and if I have time, I'm going to show you That's good enough. Okay. This is it. This is the impressive physical evidence. Um, That's the actual bag there in your hand? No, this is. Now, there's a lot of white residue on it. That's luminol that I sprayed on to look for traces of blood. Um, the, um, this is the bag. And We'll attempt to, there is a small hole in this bag, right here in this corner. I don't know if you can see it or not. Yeah, I can see it from there. There's a picture of it before we sprayed luminol on it. In fact, this was actually at the at witness's home when we took this picture. Um, you can see it's about a centimeter long. And uh, it's a hole that comports nicely with the shape that he described. He, this is his sketch of what the sliver looked like. Now this is a micrograph. The key thing about the damage to this, this polyethylene, the ordinary Ziploc bag that you can buy anywhere, um, is that all the damage is right at the margin of the hole. There is a, it, it, is a, it is a completely open hole. It is not, uh, there's no, and, and it's, it's exactly this, about a centimeter. Um, but all the damage is right at the margin of the hole, just very close to it. There's no twisting or pulling of the, uh, of the, of the plastic anywhere else. Um, so, and, and this is a micrograph I took where it shows the kind of very fine puckering and, and uh, wrinkling right there. And this is, this is a very small scale. So how would, how would I do it? Well, I always ask myself, what would Jamie do, right? You mentioned Mythbusters earlier. I'm a big fan of Mythbusters, right? They get something, they do an experiment, right? I, I'm not a forensic scientist. I, I wasn't going to go and do a detailed chemical analysis of this bag. Um, we thought about doing that, actually, but I'm not sure how promising that is. I wanted to see if I could do the same damage to the bag. So I tried cutting, tearing, poking, and heat. Now cutting doesn't produce anything like that. Cutting produces a nice clean cut. And it, it does produce a hole. You can get a hole like that, but uh, it doesn't have that kind of very fine wrinkling at the, at the margin. I tried tearing, just taking my thumb and like this and holding it very tightly and pulling it. And I didn't get anything like the same damage. Although I suppose if you experimented with enough, you could do better. Uh, I'm not going to say that it's completely ruled out. Um, so this sliver, by the way, was gone. It was disappeared. It's easy to say, oh, that's convenient, right? But a lot of people saw the sliver. It wasn't just the witness. So we know, we know the sliver existed. Um, Shame he didn't think to like take a camera photo to take a picture of it. He didn't take a picture of it, no. Um, 
so I tried, uh, I, I'm going to just tell you basically, I tried cut, tearing, cutting, and poking, and none of those were quite satisfactory. Now, there are other variables that you could explore, and perhaps you could build a little machine that could tear it very, very precisely like that. Um, but what I tried was, the, the thing that worked out best was heat. And the, the heat was, I, I was trying, I tried different ways to apply heat. I didn't want to put it in the microwave oven with a small wire, although I thought about doing that. I just was concerned about the safety of that. So I, I didn't do that. But um, what I did do uh, as a substitute for doing that with a microwave oven, um, I took just a hobby soldering iron and some solder, and I held the bag, I held a bag, not that bag, but just any bag that I had in the kitchen, open. Uh, you can see how I set it set up. I had the bag open with the, uh, one of these little th third hand type of things with a you know, magnifying glass on it. So I, I did get a hole in the bag by dropping this, this hot solder. Hot, solder is about 200 degrees centigrade. Polyethylene melts at about 110. So it's plenty hot enough to melt it. And because it was dropping, it was coming through fast. So what I wanted to do was get local, very local heat applied right at the corner of the bag. And what I got was something that was highly suggestive of the damage we had seen. It was a bigger hole, but that was because I, you know, was, I just had to drop a whole bunch of solder in there. Um, I couldn't get exactly the same size hole with this technique. But we got the damage right in the margin of the, of the hole. And it looked very similar to the damage that we had um, on the... Uh, on the on the uh, trace up on the evidence, so you can see it's right there on the margin. It's not there's behind that hole. There's no damage at all to the bag. There's no twisting, pulling, tearing, anything. Um, so what we we didn't I can't reach a definitive conclusion, but the hole in the bag is consistent with with heat applied very locally at that point. And open and creating a hole, and where it leaves us is not with a pat conclusion that aliens came and took the sliver, right? I can't I can't conclude that. But what we did conclude is that what we had was consistent with very local heating, right? About something about the size of the sliver in the bag, and we know the sliver was gone. Could this guy be hoaxing us? In principle, yes, but we've all met him, we've all spoken to him, he's come forward, there's a clear chain of custody, um, and we don't believe he's a hoaxer. We don't know that he's actually encountered aliens either, but we're skeptics. We're not going to jump to conclusions. We're going to say, here's the evidence so far. This case is still open, and there's a lot more to this case than just this little polyethylene bag. But it's the high strangest physical evidence that we're looking for. It's just, it's a, it's a start. It's a start.